Here it comes. You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after show entertainment. <laughs> Studios in Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menounos and Bing.com, and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies, this is AfterBuzz TV's WWE Monday Night Raw After Show. We'll break down tonight's episode and get you all the latest news and gossip. If you'd like to buzz in on tonight's show, you can buzz us at 424-256-1729. That's 424-256-1729. And now, another post-game wrap-up show for your favorite TV show. It's After Buzz TV's WWE Monday Night Raw After Show. What is up, everybody? So we got this here mama music playing. Today we got a special After Buzz edition. If you're a fan of wrestling, then you have to watch this. Welcome, everybody. My name is Christian Rosenberg. Um, alongside me, right next to me, lovely Kathy Kelly. How are you? Hello, everyone. Mr. Josh Paget over there. And Corey Takei. And we are joined by a man that if you follow wrestling, you know this man. He's traveled all over the world uh, like a superhero physique. And last week, he literally was a superhero. Welcome our special guest, Mr. Chris Masters, everybody. Look at that. Oh, dear God. Dear God. I'm feeling that Tupac. You're feeling a Tupac, man. I know I saw you've been blasting this song like all week. And and, and for good reason. We're for, for very good reason. You know, we'll, we'll, be, getting, we'll be getting to all that. Uh, just a little bit. We kind of want to, you know, we want to know about the life of Chris Masters, like the the great, you know, wrestling career that 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 you have had. Want to know? I'm kind of curious. Were you always like a wrestling fan, like as a young kid, like you know, growing up? Were you following it, or did you just happen to be at a certain place where someone, you know, asked you about, hey, do you want to do this wrestling stuff? No, 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 no. It wasn't like that at all. Actually, I loved pro wrestling my whole life, probably since the age of about eight or nine years old. And, uh, you know, uh, Ultimate Warrior yeah. actually caught my attention, you know, guilty as charged, <laughs> you know, but he was great. You know, I mean, looking back at the character, the music and all that, you can see why as a kid, you know, what I mean, you'd love a guy like that. But, oh, yeah. um, you know, I went through my little phase that most guys do where like around 93, I think I stopped watching for a couple of years. But then um, by the end of 95, I got sucked right back into it again. And then uh, I think I approached 16 years old and. You know, wrestling was just like the only thing I loved. So it was like career day for me. And um, I thought to myself, what can I do with my life? What do I love? And I was like, shoot, pro wrestling, you know? So I decided on that day I was going to do it. And then I started working out like crazy. And, you know, the rest is history kind of as far as, you know, my childhood and getting into it. Sure, sure. So, so you know, getting to, you know, like your train days, you were down at uh, UPW. Yep. Um, over here, you know, where you first really, like, you know, learning the ropes and stuff. How long were you, like, really down there before then you realized, like, maybe, you know, did someone see you down there and give you the call up to WWE? Or to, were you down in the Ohio Valley for a little bit before yeah. that? Okay. Well, I started in UPW, which uh, was great. I started actually at about 17 years old. The same Jeez, day as yeah. John Cena, coincidentally. Yeah. yeah, we started the same day. The prototype, right? Yeah, he was the prototype back then. <laughs> But um, I was only there a couple months. I suffered a fractured ankle injury from a leapfrog over uh, Andrew Bernardsky, who you'd know from, uh, you know, he played in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He was also in that football movie, The Program. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, anyways, I got injured, but I also realized I was too young. I was like, you know, I was 17, and all the guys that were they were looking at were real built. And so that's when it was like, you know, back to the drawing board. I, uh, I had surgery for my ankle concentrated, uh, I took bodybuilding up as a hobby in pursuit to professional wrestling. I knew I was going to come back, but I wasn't in a rush. I was like, I'm going to come back when I'm ready to really make some noise and possibly get a job. So, uh, you know, that was about, you know, until I came back when I was 19. So you, it took a couple years. Do you think you would have been ready had you not been injured at 17? No, no. It was the best thing for me, actually. Uh, you know, I was able to be real with myself. Mm -hmm. um, the injury just kind of, you know, let me, it gave me a taste of it. I saw kind of, you know, what they were looking at, well, you know, and obviously while I was still up there, they were heavy on Cena, and Cena was like built like crazy. So, 
you know, it gave me a taste of it and it made me realize kind of, uh, you know, re kind of assess my goals and the time frame for those goals. Like, you know, I just realized I'm 17. I'm, you know, why pay for wrestling school at this point when I don't really have, you know, I don't really have the option to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really become a wrestler yet. I'm not physically there and I'm so young. That's kind of mature for a 17 year old yeah. boy to understand that at that age. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I was I was still sneaking trying to watch Monday Night Raw for my mom at that time because my, <laughs> my parents hated the fact that I watched like My mom was so against me watching wrestling. I'm like, no, I need to watch it. <laughs> That's what I was doing at age 17. And you were like, you know, really going at it. And, well, and I all, loved it. I mean, yeah. I just loved it. And, you know, and I just I wanted to have a plan for what I was going to do with my life. You know, I thought that was probably the most important thing is figure out a plan and what I got to do to get there. And, uh, you know, it was just lucky that I was I had something that I was passionate about. You know, I think it'd be a lot harder if you didn't have something that you could, were passionate about mm -hmm. and that you could realistically obtain. Not to say I knew for sure I could do it, but. I, you know, I think I always had kind of confidence in myself that if I put the work in, that I had the drive and determination to uh, make it. So, uh, you know, I was able to fulfill my dream essentially, which is real cool. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You did, you did make it, and you know, they they brought you and they they hyped you up, and all of a sudden, out comes the masterpiece. Now, yeah. who, who who came up with the masterpiece? Like, was that was that an idea that you had, or no? Some... Uh, well, actually, that's kind of an interesting story. So, you know, I go back to UPW at 19. Sure. And I got signed by the time I was 20 to WWE because UPW uh, was constantly getting looks every time they would come to California by, from WWE. So uh, once I got to OVW in Louisville, this is my first time leaving home, mind you. You know, 19-year-old kid moving from Los Angeles where I was born and raised to Louisville, Kentucky. I didn't know what to expect, A little bit of man. a culture shock, right? Yeah, well, it, <laughs> it was, but, you know, it turned out to be like my college. I mean, looking back, it was some of the most fun years. We had a tight-knit group, and that leads me to kind of what you were asking me about, which is uh, I got to OVW, and it wasn't maybe a week or two in that they changed my name from Wardetsky to Masters. Dr. Tom Pritchard told me, your new name's Masters. So I was like, okay. And then, um, you know, leading on maybe a few months down the line, I was just sitting around with um, – Mickey James, Matt Morgan, Johnny Jeter, who was of the Spirit Squad, mm -hmm. and uh, probably a few others. But uh, Matt Morgan, specifically of TNA, had dropped the name Masterpiece. He had said, I don't even know what the conversation was about, but it was like, as soon as he said it, a light bulb went off. The Masterpiece, Chris Masters. I brought it to Jim Cornette the next day, and the rest is history. I mean, he ran with that, he loved it, and then WWE eventually ended up keeping that name and then that evolved into the master lock and right. you know you don't have a lot of that nowadays so it was kind of cool to have a uh, wrestling gimmick name like the masterpiece Chris Masters the master lock finisher because nowadays you'll just have you know, guys with regular names, no gimmick, yeah. no nothing. And for WWE to keep that, I feel like usually they want to create their own gimmick for every guy that comes through. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, they, well, that is true, but I mean, it was just kind of, it was it too, fit. they already changed my name to Masters, yeah. and then, you know, once we started going with Masterpiece, it just made sense, you know what I mean? Because the perception of me was, you know, I'm a quote-unquote body guy, and, yeah. uh, you know, that I could play be that role yeah. you know Vince kind of identified me with a uh, young Paul Orndorff if you go back I can see that yeah Ooh, Mr. Wonderful yeah. Mr. Yes. Wonderful yes. he worked with me a little bit actually uh, they had him work with me the first the WrestleMania was down here in LA uh, I think it was 21 maybe one uh, stable 21 yeah, yeah yeah so since you grew up like being a wrestling fan did you ever have a fanboy moment when you met someone in the WWE that you had just like admired your entire life because Josh oh. is having that right now <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think everybody I mean when I entered the WWE I, it was it's really weird because the first time I entered WWE to the second time the, you know the first time I entered was basically all guys that I had pretty much kind of grown up watching, you know what I mean? Like, I was kind of a, the generation behind them. So, uh, and, you know, uh, that's why I was real fortunate to kind of, like, work with guys like Shawn Michaels and Ric Flair and Triple H, like, because those were their last years. Mm -hmm. So these are the guys I, I mean, because Ultimate Warrior got me in the business, but Shawn Michaels I absolutely idolized growing up. I mean, because he was just, you recognize him for such a great in-ring talent. And he was just so unmatched, I mean, uh, by anybody that, like, just working with those guys was gave me that kind of feeling. But it, also you have the utmost confidence working with those guys because no matter what, the crowd's into it. And also because, like, um, 
you know these guys have been in every messed up situation you could possibly be in, so you know you're in there with professionals, and you know, so I mean, you don't really stress it as much. I'm like, I'm in here with guys with, you know, that they know their stuff. You know, and I was still so green at the time. I was maybe one or two years in. Yeah. No, definitely. And I know it, it was funny because, you know, we're, you know, preparing, you know, for you coming in. Um, you know, when Josh comes in, he, he starts imitating, you know, like your entrance pose and stuff. Because I know. Love it. Yeah, because <laughs> I know you, you told me, like, one of your favorite entrances was, like, was with his, with the posing and the sure, pyro and stuff. Sure, yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I, I loved it. Like, when you, the moment you came out, I was like, oh, man. And, and the fact that you do, you did the full Nelson. Uh, I was champion of the TWF Trampoline Wrestling Federation. Back is there really, is there really one of those? There's not really one of those. In, oh, in Josh's straight backyard. Out of, straight out of Richmond, Virginia. You I don't know. know if that's true. Oh. Uh, but I, I used to do. I, used I had to no do idea that. I was. I, was like, I had no guy. idea I was in, in like all two legends here at once. Oh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to look up this trampoline wrestling on YouTube or something. Oh, it's, uh, it's huge. It's huge. <laughs> Sounds uh, wild. All the footage got lost somehow, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, when you came out, I was like, "Look at this dude!" And you know, I, I'm I'm I, I'm a sucker for body guys too. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no <worries. laughs> but um, when you when Corey you came out with the master lock, I'm not judging. I'm not judging. Like so high. <laughs> but when you came out with the master lock, I was like, "Oh my god!" Now, how, when you guys have the master, like, how do you guys as wrestlers like? How is it decided, like, what, what your move is going to be? Like, you just tell them, like, hey, dude, I'm going to... Well, it, you know, at that time, um, you know, that wasn't necessarily my decision because I felt like uh, it was such a basic maneuver. I'm like, ah, uh, you know, I don't know if the fans are going to get into this, but Hunter really backed it. And the idea at the time in WWE was to trail back because they had gone push the envelope so far in terms of the physicality, jumping off ladders, tables, all that stuff. It was like... They're like, we need to recondition our audience because we don't. We're gonna kill off our talent. You know what I mean? And it's just, it get, you know, the next step was to literally kill somebody on TV from with the way with the way they were going. Yeah. So that was the idea of uh, kind of bringing in the full Nelson. And you know, it it is actually. I mean, if you were to uh, strip down wrestling down to its the psychology and realism and whatnot, I mean, full Nelson is a, an effective hold. I mean, I used it as a bouncer out here in L.A. when I was work, still working and going to wrestling school. I mean, because they don't want you to hit nobody, obviously. Right. They want you to restrain them and get them out. So I always thought it was funny that I ended up using that as a finishing hold. But, I mean, That's it'll awesome. really make you pass out if you tort the neck. Mm -hmm. I mean, For sure. I have ask Shelton Benjamin. Oh, you, you, made, you made him pass out once? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's going to be so mad at me. <laughs> He's gonna be so mad at me, but oh, that was more it. my fault for being so green. Was well, that, no, well, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I oh, yeah, you off. Was ahead. that at a house show or was that on TV? No, it was TV. Ooh. It was TV, but I mean, I was so bi such a big young kid, and they had me so fired up, and you know, I didn't really know uh, what, as we call it in the business, Shakespeare, which is, uh, you know, creating the uh, the act <laughs> the of illusion. movement. You're like, you know, nah, I was really swinging people around, and you know, so I mean, eventually. Uh, Eventually, you know, obviously I learned better, but you know, those were my early years, mm -hmm. so. Awesome. And you probably got like such an adrenaline kick like every time you went out there that. Yes, yes. Yeah. And see, see what I what I really love like, and they've done a little more with it over the last several years is, is wrestlers, you know, kind of any size, you see like a lot of power moves or maybe they're high flying moves, but all of a sudden the full Nelson came back for the master lock. Um, Ziggler brought back the sleeper hold. And uh, like they, these just, you're like, you're, kind of old school submissions all of a sudden are kind of bringing back to the forefront and just looking just absolutely devastating based on like the people that are that are performing them mm -hmm. much yeah. needed yeah mm -hmm. i even heard the miz is bringing back the figure four, miz has figure awesome. four now <laughs> miz is doing yeah. the figure yeah. four i heard about that wow that's uh that's he's getting better cool. at it he's getting better <laughs> i you know what that was one of those moves as a kid i used to test out you know what i mean because you want you see the moves on tv and you're like well this how much does that hurt you know does it hurt let me just say that move hurts oh yeah i've had, I've had it put on me it hurts like hell yeah my, yeah my when i was growing up like the move i always want to do was the Texas Cloverleaf. I oh, love that yeah. one. Yeah, that's like uh, a tighter sharpshooter, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, I, that's another one I did too. The Texas Cloverleaf, the sharpshooter, the figure four. I mean, we do all that stuff in the front yard. Right, right. On the grass, all itchy after, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I, I did a little bit on trampoline. I was never good enough to be in a federation. Oh, on a trampoline. I, I think I might take up this trampoline federation. <laughs> I think this might be my next step. I'll give you a title shot. I'll give you a title shot. <laughs> really, now. All right. Now, I want to. I want to talk about. Um, let's talk a little bit about the master lock challenge uh, because this this went on for a long time, like week after week. You would get this, you know, this prime like time on on Raw, and just 
really kind of like you know like display the power and they really built up the full nelson the master lock uh, you know really well with it i was kind of curious you know were, were you were you kind of like enjoying the fact that you were coming out there only really doing that move or you know because obviously you were working into you know other matches with it but there were a lot of times where it was just doing that one maneuver I don't know if maybe that was I something thought, that you were a big well, fan of. No, uh, no, but you look back and you understand what they were doing. I mean, it wasn't yeah. the most entertaining television, and I even got to the point where I was like, ah, you know, mm -hmm. this again, you know, like, I because I was a fan, and I'm like, I don't know if fans would want to see this every week, but it goes to kind of what you're saying. In order to really get those holds over, you know, you really have to build them up. Like, so the full Nelson wasn't just going to become a believable hold overnight sure you have to take that time every week invest mm -hmm. in it and like you know i can say that hunter was a big proponent of uh you know telling the uh, riders and everybody else i believe to move on keep moving with it keep moving forward like once it's if it's given time the people will buy it you know what i mean if you know if you show give it to them every week and you know i'm coming out giving these mass lock challenges eventually the hold's going to be over because they've seen it mm -hmm. and they've seen it take guys down and you know, I didn't never really uh, realize that until we did like the first uh, real big master lock challenge, which was against Shawn Michaels of all people, which was absolutely crazy for me. And it was the main event of a Raw, but you could just see how mu how that built up led into it being to the point where it could be a main event on Raw, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? A master lock challenge. Not yeah, it's not match. even a full on match. It's no, just get out of the hold. Yeah, and it, the segment turned out great. I mean, I remember my arms were turning purple. Though. <laughs> <laughs> were there um, ever any decisions that the writers made for you that you kind of like second guessed? Oh, well, I didn't like, uh, you know, after I did, this is the, my second time around, uh, specifically something that stands out is doing the peck dance every week. She you know? really wanted to ask you about that, about uh, the peck the, dancing. When Ozzy Osbourne <laughs> and Sharon Osbourne were on there for America's Got Talent, I think, I mean, like, I watched the viral video of uh, yeah. the, the peck dance to Crazy Train, and I thought yeah. that was hilarious. It was. Unfortunately, I think I made it too hilarious, or I, I, or <laughs> I put too much, I, I made it too good because... Then it was like it became they wanted to you you know use, use me in that time, role. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like to me it was like I was like yeah it was funny but like th this should bridge to maybe my real personality which is like anybody who knows me knows I'm pretty silly. Yeah. And I don't take myself too serious seriously and I can still be lovable and cocky so I was like how can we uh, you know bridge that mm -hmm. you know that moment into something else. And not just have it yeah. be about bouncing pecs all the time. You know what I mean? That wasn't the intention. So that got kind of old to me, and I felt like that was bad writing after yeah. a certain point, especially after my work rate really turned up in the uh, second. Like, because when I first initially came back, you know, it took me about a year to really get in the swing of things. But my last year and a half with the company was when my work rate was at its absolute highest. Like, I couldn't have a bad match with a heel on the show. And it was just because. You know, once after a certain amount of years in, you start really understanding what's important about a match and how to get a, yourself emotionally invested, how to get the crowd to have sympathy for you as a baby face, how the storytelling aspect, mm -hmm. the art of it, all that stuff, you know? You get into the groove of things. Yeah, well, you start learning what's important, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, about a match, and that's uh, believing it yourself. As long, if you believe it yourself, everybody else will believe it, you know? Yeah. Um, I want to I want to talk about a little bit, you know, about a week and a half from now is, you know, WrestleMania. You um, you got to participate in WrestleMania 22, I believe it was, when you teamed with Carlito. Yeah. Um, just just the thought of like just the atmosphere of being like, you know, I've made it to the point where I'm getting to perform at a WrestleMania. It's just like, you know, like going out there, you know, what? Like, what was your mindset? Like, what, did you have more butterflies than you might normally before a match for that particular yeah, time? Yeah, but or? also just that much more adrenaline. It sure. really balances it out, you know what I mean? Because your nerves are up, but your adrenaline's up, too. And to be honest, um, you know, everybody always asks me about that one. But um, the funny part is, is a, the year prior was 21 that right. we had talked about. And uh, that was at Staples Center. And that was when I first started. And I didn't work WrestleMania the show. But I actually worked the Battle Royal before the show, which was awesome enough for me, and it's my home Hometown. crowd. Hometown, yeah, yeah. And I happened to be the last guy, and Booker T won the match, but I ended up going down to be the last guy with Booker T, and, and like, just the whole finishing sequence of the uh, Battle Royal went so good, and it was, it was like a pretty awesome Battle Royal, so that was actually probably... Uh, 
I, I would say it's just as much of a highlight as the next year being on the actual WrestleMania card, especially because there's a lot more money in that, you sure. know, once you get the payday. Mm -hmm. But um, I will say that it was really special just being able to be in the Staples Center and have that moment um, that early into my career. I was probably, uh, you know, only I've been on the road for about three months. They were still airing my vignettes at that point, I believe, right? Just started maybe. Sure. No, definitely. Yeah, what were you, like 22, 23 at the time? I was about 21. 20. I got signed at 19, and I was on the road by the end of age of 20, and then uh, I started officially on TV around 21 years old. Wow. And that's so young. For yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as a baby. Were, were, you, were you at all, just out of curiosity, bummed at all? Because, like, you know, when you wrestled on WrestleMania 22, that was the last WrestleMania that day uh, before they started going to the giant football stadiums. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, I would have loved to work in one of those, right. man. Because I've, I've, heard, I've heard different things from guys who have done them because I've heard some stories from guys hating it because obviously you're in front of so many more people, but because it's open, you don't really hear the response like you would at Staples Center or, or when, you, um, when you did at WrestleMania 22. Well, that's true, and the perfect example, actually, was I watched the Shawn Michaels Undertaker retirement match, mm -hmm. and I was on the side, and I, I noticed that the sound travels so much, so you don't get that same feeling of condensed energy on top of you because it spreads out mm -hmm. so much. So it does kind of take away from the, uh, the energy, I think, a little bit, but still, I mean, just once you look around and you see that no, that amount of people. 60, 70, 80,000 people. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just the visual just overwhelms you, you know what I mean, too. But it is a very different feeling than an arena where it's closed off, and, you know, you do feel that more, I think, as a performer. I can only say just from the sidelines, though, like I said, I watched yeah. the match live out there because I knew it was going to be special. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, by the way, let's let's just uh, bring up iTunes real quick because we're I mean we're on we're on a roll right now. But mm -hmm. you know, for for those of you that might want to you know download this or rate it and comment it, you can go over to iTunes, search for AfterBuzz, look up you know this interview with Chris Masters, as well as you know all the AfterBuzz shows. We have AfterBuzz Raw, AfterBuzz SmackDown, AfterBuzz Main Event. You can check them all out. Rate, comment, and please tell friends. Tell your friends that we are talking freaking Chris Masters, <laughs> and they should like download and give a five star rating. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Everyone agreed yeah. to that. Everyone yeah. agrees. <laughs> five stars. I agree. <laughs> I, I agree. agree. You're endorsing I, us. Five stars. I, five stars. <laughs> Ten stars. Ten, I, he Ten stars. Nice. Uh, before we go further, can I ask about his body? <laughs> oh sure. What about it? The floor. Yeah. Exactly. The, the floor <laughs> is yours. What do you want to know? <laughs> and the masterpiece here. So. Uh, when did at what age did you start becoming disciplined with your body in terms of what you're dieting, how you're exercising, and when did you really fulfill being the masterpiece? Well, it's, I was really skinny as a kid. I was like as skinny as you can get. I was about a, a buck sixty and probably close to the same height I am now, maybe an inch shorter or whatever, two inches shorter. Yeah. But um, so it, for me, I started eating like a pig and working out, and I eventually ballooned up to about three hundred pounds. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Yeah, it's pretty fat. That's like twice as much. How much? Yeah, I mean, it took, a, it took a while, and, like, I didn't look good by any means, but I kind of had the plan. I was like, you know, I knew I had a fast metabolism, so I'm like, all right, I need – I'm so skinny. You know, I just – I got to put on weight, and then, uh, you know, I'm eventually going to have to cut weight. And I remembered just one day waking up and being like – looking at myself in the mirror and being like, wow, you're fat. Uh -huh. I was like, I, I just saw the tire around my waist. I'm like, all right, I think it's time to uh, clean it up a little bit. And then I went, dropped down to about 240 pounds and I was pretty lean and muscular. And then, uh, you know, just started trying to, to go up and down a little bit, you know what I mean? And put on quality weight. And then by the time I was 19, I was pretty filled out. So, I mean, two and a half years of consistently t working out and you know, still learning. I never had a trainer. I taught mm. myself everything. Mm. So, you know, it took two, about two and a half years of consistency, and then I was pretty, I mean, I, like I said, I came back to UPW, and I was signed mm. probably within six months. Did wow. you follow a yeah. certain plan, or it's just kind of asking people around if you taught yourself how to? I read magazines. I watched people in the gym, uh, and I just, mm. I, you know, I was Did learning. You watch people in the gym? <laughs> Well, I mean, if, you know, no, I, know, I still do. If I not, see, not like a creepy I know. way. I'm so, joking. I'm joking. Well, well, if you well, watch all the time. Okay with it. Well, I mean, if you two were working on the gym, I would at least <laughs> take a second. But, but um, he was pointing at me. I, I know. <laughs> true. No. But um, 
Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, it was just about um, consistency and, uh, you know, I just, uh, and like I said, initially I was so skinny, I didn't have like a diet scheme. Yeah. I just consumed, like, I was in high school stealing the little carton milks that they give out. You know, you're allowed one per person. <laughs> I'd go over to that milk bin, I'd be looking around. <laughs> I'd stuff like five of them in my bag at nutrition and lunch because then, you know, you get 50 grams of protein if you got five milks. So uh, <laughs> this there you is go. Awesome. Yes. I yeah. mean, you know, milk is great. Have I mean, if you're a skinny kid and you're trying to bulk up, have some milk with every this meal. This is like a got I mean, milk ad. Is it, it is. Is, that right? Maybe is it like I, force feeding yourself or like what is that? Yeah, I kind of almost was force feeding myself just because I was on such a mission because I was just so damn skinny. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I know I need to put on weight. But, uh, you know, it's funny because then I ended up going the opposite way and I turned into like the you know kind of chubby guy I don't think I was fat because I was still tall and carried it okay but um yeah mm -hmm. yeah I oh. forgot what the original question was about the diet <laughs> well, well she was just talking about, about your body <laughs> oh well yeah and then, ta and, then, and then talk about as far as learning from people in the gym I mean you know like I read magazines like crazy I took up bodybuilding as a hobby so you know I was learning a lot of stuff on the fly and then you know you see you see people in the gym they, I mean even to this day I'll see sometimes somebody doing an interesting exercise and I'm like oh well, you know I should give that a shot and they might not be half my size it might even be a woman but you know <laughs> you know I, I, I look or you know I'm observant of things and whatnot and uh, but mainly I just taught myself everything and you know it's been a lot of trial and error you know what I mean like you find out what works for you and what doesn't and what like you know you're asking me about my diet now and you know I do ketosis I try to do no carbs it's a diet I like it's a diet that keeps me lean I'm not uh, 275 pounds like when I debuted, but uh, I'm at the perfect kind of athletic weight for myself where I'm not too big, but not too small. And, you know, I perform better at this weight. You know what I mean? I just move better. I mean, I just, you know, flow better, everything, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. was, was there someone um, that you kind of aspired to look like at all? Uh, Besides me. You know what? I, I, uh, <laughs> I always, uh, I always, Sylvester Stallone and Rocky, I'm not saying I aspired for that physique, but like, I mean, to me, that even above Arnold is the, That's the epitome. The epitome. I mean, he looked so awesome and he was just so ripped and mm -hmm. just everything about it. He wasn't too big, but he just looked good, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was funny because I just watched on TV, they took a poll on Arnold at, when he was 19 and his kid when he was 19. And, you know, <laughs> Patrick, Arnold, yeah, that's a Arnold totally lost out like by 90%, but that's because, you know, nobody. Like, you know, it's good to be big and all, and some people might love it, but for the most part, I mean, people don't want somebody who's, you know, it's not as yeah. attractive to be 280 and pounds Arnold muscle bound. He was huge. He was huge. So exactly. Well, yeah, nowadays, huge. they like them all scrawny and hipstery. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it depends about, on people's preferences. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't find that. I think, uh, depending I. on the girl, I mean, some women like athletes. If a woman likes an athlete, we'll you know, come to I mean, you. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it, but if a woman likes maybe a rocker, they're going to go for that guy. I don't know. You know, everybody has their types. Sure. Right? Yeah, like Adam Levine was on mus like men's fitness cover this Which this, is a travesty, like, but... I'm like, what's going on here? Like, what's the Adam he, Levine he really workout? Was. He was? Yeah, yeah he's he on was. it right yeah. now. I'm like, You're what? Like, what yeah, but, you he's know, like but, 80 pounds. <laughs> but he's going to sell the magazine. Yeah. Girls like him and stuff. But, but it that, is a travesty when you think... Like, it's it's a travesty, skinny. though, when you think about it. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least he's not on the cover of Flex or something like that. Then yeah, it would be... Like Super Buff Strongman Magazine is Adam Levine. Um, I got to ask, do you like your women athletic as well? Oh, yeah. I love <laughs> I, You know, I do because I kind of look at working out like hygiene now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know, who doesn't really want to take care of themselves? It's not just right. about necessarily uh, how you look, but uh, it's just as the same as brushing your teeth every day to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I understand some people don't have time. You know what I mean? Sometimes, like, life is overwhelming or whatever, but... I mean, even on the WWE schedule, we were only able to work out sometimes 30, 45 minutes, but we made it in there. But granted, it is our job, so that's why I don't hold other, other people to the same account. I'm like, you know, if you have a normal job where you don't have to wrestle in your underwear, you know, I can understand you're not going to make the gym top priority. But, you know, it is, of course, good to take care of yourself and if you can find 30 minutes in a day. But, uh, and also, I love a good set of wheels on a woman, you know what I mean? Why not? There it is. <laughs> you know? There, yes. <laughs> Good set of jo wheels. Josh agrees. You know, <laughs> a nice set of glutes. Why not? There you go. I'll take it. You Gotta know. get them squats in, ladies. Yep. <laughs> you want the masterpiece. Walking lunges. You know. Yeah. 
Yeah. I have to say, we asked for Twitter questions, and half of the Twitter questions were from girls. And they were like, is Chris single? Like, what does he look for in a girl? <laughs> so, we do still have some lady fans. Oh, that's great. And uh, so now they're going to think I'm a complete pig. <laughs> no, no you, you're going to find them in the gym. Getting yes. ready. Uh, yeah, yeah. I hope that, that I hope that you're going to look at them. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They need to come down to the Gold's Gym, Venice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Now, now everyone knows plane tickets have already been purchased. <laughs> um, I want to talk uh, just a little bit, you know, like at the time um, when, you know, when you were, you know, like, you know, ult ultimately um, released, a lot of people, like, you know, when that time comes, they might, you know, get angry or they might, you know, just kind of give up on stuff. But you worked your way back in. Like, you, you, you know, because you got, you know, like, you got brought back. I was just kind of curious, you know, like, what was your... What was your mindset when you were, you know, going through that period where, you know, you know, you were you were let go, but you know, like, no, I'm I'm not done yet. I'm not I'm still going for this. Well, those were some dramatic years in my life because I had I you know I take full responsibility for my first release. You know, the second one was a little bit more of a shocker to me, but mm -hmm. I had fallen into the you know kind of typical, almost cliche at this point, wrestling problem, which was. Uh, prescription pills I ended up having to go to rehab for that and I'm not afraid to talk about it now because I've uh, you know I fought that battle and you know I haven't gone back right but um so you know I, I obviously I became a liability to the company and you know I, I understood they let me go but I always through that time I mean I wasn't thinking about going back but I think in the back of my mind I always knew that I wanted to make things right and get myself right and you know eventually come back and I was so young that I could do that but uh you know, I wasn't telling myself that at the time. It took a couple of years. Like, I worked uh, the independent wrestling like I'm doing now. I still worked a lot, and I traveled all over Europe and went to Japan and did all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but it was like, you know, eventually once I decided, you know, nobody's going to get better from a situation like that until you can honestly look at yourself and, and know for a fact that you have a problem. And the problem was before that, even when I had gone, WWE had sent me to rehab, I didn't believe I had a problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went to rehab and I picked up good tools for later on, but I still wasn't convinced and I eventually messed up again. You know what I mean? I had a relapse and, you know, that's what kind of, uh, you know, it just kind of sucks because I did have the machine behind me of WWE up until about that point and then it kind of derailed my whole career and it was... It's been hard to get back ever since, you know what I mean? It's been really hard, you know, like I did get back, but I didn't really get back back, you know, I never really got the shot that I got the initial time when, you know, unfortunately I wasn't ready. Right. Now, well, yeah, when, um, after, you know, when it came to like, you know, like the second release you're talking about, with that year and a half, how you really were like pushing, talking about your work rate. I'm, you know, right after that, um, you know, CM Punk on Raw, you know, cut a, uh, cut a promo live on TV about, about like recent releases, about yeah. people who recently released, and one of the people he talked about was you and praising you, you know, about how you busted your ass over that time and how he f how he felt it was wrong. And you know, this isn't something you know you normally see wrestlers talk about no. on TV. How did that make you feel, knowing that like you know one of your peers was actually like you know kind of almost taking a risk in a way by like you know talking about this live on, on air about about you and and how he was like proud of you and praising your work rate. Uh, well, it, it didn't surprise me because CM Punk was always kind of, uh, he would pull me aside and he showed me respect in my last year, year and a half there. And, uh, you know, he's not typ the, typically the guy to do that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and that meant a lot from him. And uh, it was really cool. He's just a real supportive guy. So I wasn't surprised that he threw that in there because he saw on a nightly basis how hard I was working. I mean, because I got to the point where I was like, they don't have me in storylines. I'm lost in the shuffle, but I'm going to go out there and I'm going to give that crowd every mm -hmm. possible ounce of me I have, and I'm just going to let the cards fall where they may. So, I mean, and that's the mentality I had every night, and I was never discouraged. You know, a lot of guys will tend to get either discouraged or whatever if they're not in a, a storyline or they're not, uh, you know what I mean, if they're not getting the push or whatnot. But for me, I was just it just fueled my motivation, you know what I mean? It just made me want to go out there every night and make them do something with me. You know, it was just my mission in life. But it also became my love because I never felt more comfortable than that point. I mean, it was my outlet every week going out there and performing. I mean, it was no longer something where I, I kind of, you know, you always are a little nervous before you perform. But, you know, I can probably say in my, the beginning of my career being so young, I was, you know, literally almost scared. 
And uh, eventually, it just became something I embraced. You know what I mean? Like, let me go out there and, like, really just, I believe in myself. I believe I can go out there and do it. I can believe I can entertain these people. I be believe I can give them a good show. And uh, let me just go out and do it. Now, Chris, forgive me. I don't fully understand how things work back there. I'm not really a smart uh, I try to be, but I'm not. Uh, so, like, smarts. <laughs> you know, what's we, a smart? You know, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, I'm using it correctly, right? Yeah. Uh, no, so, no, anyway, so like, go on. <laughs> when you're when you're a wrestler and you're not you're not getting afforded the opportunities of creative making storylines for you, like stuff, uh, airtime, things that are going to get get you on TV. What 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 is a wrestler like like you when you were in that position? You said you go out there and you, you're busting your ass every night. Like you, at house shows and any chance that you you were going in the ring against somebody, you would just would you would you sit down with the other wrestler and like really like let, let's let's tear the house down? Uh, well, I mean that that goes without saying. Every wrestler has the intention of wanting to go out there and tear the house down. But you gotta uh, you know you gotta lay out the foundation and tell the right story and whatnot. But um. The uh, you're asking what the motivation was? Or? No, like what what is what is a wrestler to do? Well, I mean it's it, you know I've listened to a lot on Sirius XM. I mean it sounds like Saturday Night Live almost. I mean you really got to pitch your uh, if you're lost in the shuffle. I mean your best shot is to pitch ideas and whatnot. I mean you know the difference between you know Zack Ryder was going nowhere and then he did that YouTube show and it really became a hit. And I mean, I, I think really, I mean, that saved probably his job. You know what I mean? Sure, that could have sure. been the difference between him staying and me staying. You know, I was just, I was under the impression, I'm like, I didn't know necessarily. I mean, Hunter had come up to me at one point and had acknowledged how far I'd progressed and said, you're really good now. And we just got to figure out how to give you a fresh coat of paint or repackage you. Because, you know, I, they had booked me, you know, I'd been booked pretty bad up until that point, but now they had kind of seen you know, an opportunity like, wow, he can be really good, but we need to give, we need to make him different somehow, or you need to be out of the picture maybe, or something like that, you know, because you can't, you can't, the fans can't really swallow you going from being a mid-card guy to all of a sudden being a threat overnight, you know what I mean, once they've already been programmed and seen you lose. So, uh, you know, I mean, was so yeah. So oh, okay, well, you answered it. You like you can go to a creative and be like, yeah. listen, I got I got like a, a script of stuff here that yeah. I think. But I mean, a lot of times they didn't take your ideas, and I was kind of lost. I didn't really even know what to do as far as repackaging right. at that point. I mean, I would have loved to sit down and talk, but you know, um, it was hard to communicate with a lot of the writers mm -hmm. too. You know, what I mean, I didn't have personal relationships, and that's kind of an important thing because then they don't know your personality. You know, mm -hmm. like. I have a friend of mine, Chris Bell, who did Bigger, Stronger, Faster, the movie, uh, the documentary, and he was a writer for WWE for a while, but he's worked with me on a lot of other projects, and I always tell him, I'm like, man, I wish you were a writer while I was up there, because he knows, you know, he knows my strong points, he knows what situations to put me in, he knows my personality, and uh, like, that's kind of the person, type of person you need, you know, I on your side, or an idea, you know what I mean? You can pitch ideas. Right. But, I mean, like I said, I wasn't used to that because when I first got to WWE, I mean, everything was just laid out for me. I mean, I didn't have to really think of anything. I mean, Masterpiece, Masters was given mm -hmm. to me. Masterpiece was... Uh, it just all fell into place. Yeah, yeah, it just all fell into place. The machine was behind me. They ran my vignettes. I didn't have to pitch yeah. any ideas. I mean, I was just in storylines, and I was a vocal part of the mm -hmm. show. So... I was kind of lost the second time out when I was lost in the shuffle and I didn't have that. Were there any um, storylines that you wish you had that never really came about? Um, I can't think of it at the time. Yeah, yeah I can't think of something right now specifically. I mean, um, I think they should have left Carlito and me together for a little longer when we were in our first run because we were a pretty good tag team and I could feed off him pretty well. Yeah, you guys had though it was like good interact. Like it was kind of like the team that might have argued a little bit, but then got like folks got their, oh, their yeah. minds straight and then yeah, took care it of was business. A, it was a love hate relationship. Yeah, yeah, and it was sure. funny. You know, <laughs> yeah, we yeah, it was entertaining. You you had Carlito, who you know, I mean, I know he's gotten a lot more jacks since he's left. I've seen photos of oh, him. Oh yeah, body guy Lito. Body guy Lito is what he calls himself <laughs> now. But I mean, you know, obviously you definitely had the the contrast and you know like the physical appearance. But then he he had more of like the dirty tactics behind him. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you. he was so constantly kind of screwing well. me over, but yeah. then we'd make up, and that was really kind of us. I mean, we almost got into a fight on an airplane one time. 
And literally five minutes later, we're watching a movie on a DVD player together. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's adorable. Yeah, that's we, a relationship right there. I have this weird relationship with him, unlike any other wrestler, where we just kind of get together and we just we just get crazy. You know what well, I mean? Our, our, half of our dialogue doesn't even make sense. <laughs> well, I, well, I know I know you get a chance to you know work alongside him sometimes. That you know all these you know. Um, independent shows that that you're wrestling at now. You're literally going all over the world. You were in Italy the other day. Right? Oh yeah, that was a what? hard trip to make too, because that was after uh, last week's ordeal. But right. um, yeah, I went to Turin, Turin, Italy. Which, uh, I mean, I know it sounds great, but it was raining every day, you know. So Aww. what? Are, what are the? Do you have? Do you sense like a real difference in? in uh, the crowds like obviously you know the crowds might not be as large as they were when you're on like the WWE shows no. but like as far as like you know like their adrenaline or their appreciation for you or things like that oh uh, well it's more intimate and yeah. uh, you know it's uh, you know I still have just as much of a thrill performing in front of like you know it's just the venues are smaller like when I this show in Turin uh, Italy was uh, for NWE which uh, ran Back on my last indie run, I worked with them, and uh, it was a 1,500-seat arena. Oh, nice. But they sold it out. So, I mean, when you have a situation like that, that's a good situation because, you know, it's not like you have a 10,000-seat arena that only filled 2,000, which is going to be, you know, it's going to kind of suck for uh, energy-wise because there's going to be so much open room. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like going back to the big stadium versus big arena argument. But, um yeah, I mean, I still get that kick. I mean, you know, not necessarily at every indie show because not all indie shows are good. Let me tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've been there myself. I know. <laughs> I know that. So, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, I will say some of the most fun I've had in the business has been outside WWE, but that's because, you know, with WWE, you're on the constant grind and it's nonstop. You're literally, you have to be married to it. So, mm -hmm. you know, when, uh, when you're on this side of the business, uh, like doing the indie scene, it's kind of everything you love without having to necessarily marry it and without, you know, politics and all the other stuff that come into play when there's big money involved and big business of like, you know, a, a WWE or even a TNA. Sure. So, uh, you know, I really enjoy this aspect of the business. But, I mean, you know, if you're going to be a professional wrestler, I mean, you don't want to make indie wrestling your career. So right. at mm -hmm. the same time. So, I mean, you know, you want to be on the big show. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, you you kind of uh, brush on the fact, you know, that you know, like, you know, just before you went to Italy, we had this. Let's let you know, let's let's talk about this. I know you've been talking nonstop about it for the last you week. You were on How GMA, you were on TMZ. Yeah. I mean, you you are a bona fide legitimate hero and evolve it and, mm -hmm. and it's the fact that you literally you saved your mom. Yeah. Um, you know, just kind of I mean, I know you've done it on plenty of other shows, but you know, for the Afterbuzz crowd, if you can kind of just maybe like you know, no. break it down for us yeah, on, it's fine. on what exactly happened. I'll tell it for the uh, 60th time. No problem. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. No, 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 no. I have no problem. Um you know, it just uh just to break it down for you, like yeah. you said, break it down. Break it, uh, break it down. I got a call when I was at the gym. You know, shocking, right? I was you at the gym. At the gym? What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would know? But I got a call from the um, uh, neighbor of my mom's. She's been our neighbor for like 30 years, and she tells me that I should come down. That the police were at my mom's place, and that something's going on. So I said, you know, I asked her. I'm like, you said the police were there, like past tense. You know, I'm like, they're gone now. She said, yeah, but you should still come down. So then I call my mom, and um, you know, when I call my mom's place, I, she lives with my uncle. So you either get my mom, my uncle, or the answer machine. I call twice, and I just, it just keeps ringing. So that mm -hmm. automatically to me is like, all right, I'm heading over there. I get there. I pull up in my truck in the driveway, and I see my uncle knocking on the door. And I'm like, you know, I shout from the truck, like, what's going on? You know, what's up? I approach the scene, and I hear my uncle talking through the door, telling he's like, come on, man. He's like trying to sway somebody to open the door. So uh, I find out, you know, through talking through the door now, I make, you know, I, you know, obviously I walk up, I find out it's the neighbor who I had met just a couple days prior, actually. I had to come to visit my mom and uncle and pick up some mail. And this neighbor, he had just come in the house without even knocking too. And, you know, he introduced himself. He was kind of weird too, stuck around a little too long type of thing, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a shirt on. You know, yeah, it was just, it was kind of weird, but I was like, oh, well, maybe my, he's the neighbor, maybe my uncle has befriended this guy, but, you know, I could have never predicted what was going to happen. So I start talking through the door, I realize it's him, and I'm like, he starts demonizing my uncle, saying my 
uncle's the devil, he's killing my mom, this, that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, if you got a tiff or beef with my uncle, that's fine. My uncle is now 10 feet away. I'm like, you know, this is me. I'm here now. That's my mom in that house. Uh, open the door. And he starts uh, going into this rant saying, uh, no, listen, I'm her son now too. Uh, she's my mom. Yeah, and then I'm like, oh, you know. And You're then, uh, crazy. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm <laughs> done with the wacko. So yeah. I mean, uh, you know, then everything changed because then I was like, I got a situation. So yeah. I start yelling to my mom's room because it's right next to the front door. I'm like, Mom, what's going on? Are you okay? And she's almost speaking like uh, code, you know, to me. She yells back window at one point because she's trying to tell me a way that I might be able to get in, and then she also yells something about fire and don't do anything. So I mean. You know, I, I survey the uh, premises, I walk around, I'm trying to figure out a good way to get in. I don't even know at this point. He has my mom barricaded in her room. He has the front door barricaded with numerous pieces of furniture, whatever the hell he could find. And, um, but like I'm kind of, you know, I'm pacing around the premises and I'm wondering why the cops left also too. That's another thing. Sure. And I get to th this boiling point where there's no way to really get in the house because like I can't even break in the back window because if I break in, I won't be able to get in there fast enough from the angle and the size of the window where, I mean, I would get in and he'd probably hear the glass and be right in there to stab me before I could even do anything. Uh, but I'm fuming because I'm like, I feel so helpless and my mom is in this place and this guy is not opening the door. So it took every ounce of me not to start kicking the door open because I was thinking to myself, I'm like, if I kick, try to kick this door open, it doesn't come down. They could incite him to do something. And then, you know, then what happens? Mm -hmm. So what I do is I'm like, I get my uncle back over and I walk out to the mill street and I tell my uncle, I give him the Iggy to keep talking, keep the guy talking. I call the police and I tell him, you know, I don't know what's going on, but you guys were just here and you left and my mom's entrapped in her house. She's imprisoned and I'm about to bust the door down. So you better get down here and give me some backup. You know what I mean? Because I was like every second that went by felt like five minutes to sure. me, you know? So uh, eventually they get there and uh, about maybe five minutes later and uh, you know, we explain the situation. Then the original cops even come and uh, this is a part of the story that I don't know because before I got there, they had talked to my, they had taken my uncle out of the house. You know how I said the cops were originally there? Yep. They had taken my uncle out of the house and questioned him and at which point that was when the, my mom got locked in the house with the neighbor and uh, my uncle couldn't get back in. And then on top of it, they, the police left with the keys. So my uncle's locked out without keys and what? the cops left. Yeah. Th mm. So this is oh, going to okay. be, well, this is going to be some stuff when this guy's tried that's going to have to come out because none of that makes sense to me. But sure. the police come back and now we have a key. Mm -hmm. So they tell us to stay about 10 or 15 feet away from the apartment building, which we do. They form a perimeter around the house and one of the police officers starts gesturing towards the top bolt to, you know, unlock it. And I, I couldn't hear it from where I was at, but he must have yelled something that got the police startled because they all got into like their, you know, defensive stance and, you know, and at this point, you know, I start moving in because I'm like, I'm not leaving anything to chance because to me, I already feel like they're being very timid and this is my mom, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to let her die. Like, y'all can be as hesitant as you want about how you're going to approach this, but I'm making sure she gets out of there. And... Um, so once uh, once I start approaching the scene, the so now you know he's made some kind of threat. Now the biggest police officer, bigger than me, taller than me, he had his you know high tech Magnum boots on, starts putting the big boot to the door. Man, he boots that thing four times, nothing. The door is not coming down. And at this point, I probably worked from 10 feet to maybe about uh, well or 15 feet to about like eight feet away from the scene, and I look. As he's doing this, I see that he's not succeeding, and then I look in the front window and I see the glow of a fire starting. Oh, and yeah. that's when I was like, "Oh hell no, I'm moving in." You know, I'm moving in. I'm not leaving this to chance. I'm not leaving yep. this to the co the police. I mean, I'm going to make sure one way or another, she's out of that place because you know I'll be more willing to risk my life than they will probably. Mm -hmm. So, but what happens is they break that window. I take the hose and I start sticking the hose inside the hole that they made in the window, right where the fire uh, emanated. And then um, about 30 seconds later, one of the police officers takes over the hose. But Grant, remember, we don't have a fire truck here yet. No, it's fire, just, it's the just your garden hose. Right yeah, yeah, it's just the garden hose. So the, the fire truck hasn't got there yet. We just have the police. So I come around to the front of the house, and finally they got the battering ram, which I've been asking for forever. I'm like, the guy doesn't have a gun. We're pretty damn sure. Just get the battering ram. 
knock the door down and let's get in there and take this freaking guy down, you know? Because every second, like I said, felt like 10 minutes to me. So like, even when they got there, as they're forming this perimeter, it's like, you know, come on, come on. Like, you know, what's the deal? Let's just get in there, you know? And uh, so they finally, the battering ram after three tries gets the door off its hinges. But then smoke just comes burrowing out. And like the, literally the cops start selling. I mean, they can't even advance. They start selling away because they're getting smoke inhalation. So at that point, and then on top of it, like I said, the door was barricaded. So even after their initial sell, they're like, they're struggling to get in because it's not just the door they gotta move, it's this, it's that, it's just a million things. So that's when, I mean, from the minute I grabbed that hose, I was in quarterback mode, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I came around, I saw that that was not a good option, and now it wasn't even, is my mom gonna burn? Is she gonna die of smoke inhalation? So I was like, we gotta do something. I'm like, this is her room. Break these effing windows. You know, obviously I didn't really say effing, but you get the <laughs> point. And they start reaching around the windows, but it was blocked by that big ass tree. You know, it's, uh, I don't even know what kind of type of tree it was, but basically I reached up and that was where the big part of the story that everybody flips <laughs> out on is I didn't rip the tree out of its hinges, but I did bear hug the tree down to the floor and broke it to the point where it was parallel. And then they broke the farthest window, no sign of her. They broke the closest window. Um, at this point, I pop up and then she pops out and it was like I've never loved my mom more than that moment. I've said on ABC and everything, it was just like, oh. And then, you know, there was one piece of glass. I broke that, which is some of these cuts you can see here. Sure. Pulled her out of the window, pulled her to safety, made sure she was okay. And it was just uh, the most relief I've ever felt in my life. I don't think I've ever loved her more than that moment sure. where I saw her pop up because you know, I mean, that's the closest I've ever seen her to possibly dying. And I, how would I have been able to live yeah. with myself? Mm -hmm. It would have been really hard to live with myself if and I knew she went out like that. Yeah. We want to say from the entire AfterBuzz family, we are so happy that you and your family are safe. Yeah. Oh, how, 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 how is yeah. how is how is your mom right now? Like, she she doing okay? Or? She's still startled. Oh, startled, sure. Yeah, she's still startled. She's at a point in her life where she's been in isolation for a while anyway, and uh, you know, this doesn't help. But I think you know she does enjoy staying with me. Probably a little too much, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> she's never gonna want to leave. But um, you know, I'm again. I mean, I'm just happy she's alive. I mean, there's a lot of aftermath yeah. to deal with, and there's mm -hmm. a lot that we we're gonna have to do going forward. And she's gonna have to, you know, I gotta get all this stuff out of the place tomorrow, get movers and everything. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, ultimately, the biggest thing is, you know, we got her out of the place, and uh, you know, they eventually pulled him out too. So, hey, what was he doing when you? We're pulling that tree down and, and getting your mom out of he there. He was somewhere in the house. I don't know. Like, and this is the scariest part is you got to think about my mom. She's barricaded in her bedroom. And like I said, this guy's just having his way with the house. Mm. Like, he's telling her yeah. that she's going to die. He told her she was going to meet Jesus that night. He said that he was going to blow up the house. He's like, if you keep talking to them, I'm going to blow up the house. Like, he was making all these threats to her. So that's why oh she could gosh. only speak. Like, she said a few things from the window, but you know, she didn't want to talk too much because... Because she didn't want him to get the idea. Yeah, well, but yeah. she was trying to give me the Iggy that this was not cool, you know, like the, that this the mm -hmm. situation, you know, like this guy's trying to do stuff. And, like, you know, just imagine her from her room having to listen to the guy going through your possessions, yeah. breaking stuff, oh running God. the bathtub, stacking wood on the oven, telling you you're going to die. Like, to me, when I reflected on the whole situation, that was the part that got me most is knowing that my mom was put through that, you know? And, uh, you know, if they would have left him out there, I mean, honestly, I would have killed the guy. I mean, I think mm. anybody can sympathize with that. If somebody tries to kill your mom, yeah, you know, like, he's lucky. He's lucky that the police got him, to be honest, because sure. I would have not, yeah. you know, I would have not got off him. Yeah, I mean, um, I just wanted to, you know, as, as, you know, as someone that's obviously, you know, like, follow wrestling their whole life, been, you know, like, kind of, you know, working, obviously, on the independent side for a number of years, it's, it's so, it's, I mean, obviously, don't want any circumstance like this to happen at all. Yeah. But it's it's kind of refreshing in a way for mainstream media to have a positive story about a professional wrestler. Because yeah. whenever TMZ's talk, I mean, TMZ or you know, any main news outlets, it's usually because somebody died or somebody got arrested mm -hmm. or something or something with drugs. Yeah. You know, the only good one. stuff is when someone's promoting a movie. Yeah. <laughs> like it's never yeah. anything. But I mean, this this brings such. It, I mean, obviously, you know, to you, um, you know, but in the world of wrestling as well, it's like, hey, there, there are some guys that aren't, you know, like, you know, crazy or, or yeah. things like that. I mean, you know, it, and 
I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, what's, what has been like, the response, you know, to you personally from, you know, your, your peers, obviously, of course, checking that you and your mom are okay, I'm sure, and everything like that. But, I mean, or, I mean or, were they kind of, you know, kind of on the same boat with that as like, oh, you know, you know, you're, you're a hero. You're, you're bringing a, a real positive light to the world of pro wrestling from, from this. Yeah, Obviously, I, you didn't, you didn't want to have to do something like this. You weren't exactly, this wasn't exactly in your schedule. Well, it wasn't, but, on, <laughs> it wasn't on my mind at all. I, of course. I didn't, you know, at the time, obviously, it was just about getting my mom out of there alive. Right. And I didn't expect the accolades of being a national or international hero after the uh, yeah. incident. But I did realize pretty quickly, I think Lance Storm was the first one to tweet me or make a tweet saying, hey, it's nice to see some positive, uh, some positive stuff in the news about pro wrestling for once. You know, it's not, you mm -hmm. know, somebody, like you said, dying or going to jail or whatever. You know what I mean? I, I mean, wrestling is... The redheaded stepchild of entertainment. Sure. I mean, so many people in this country love it, but it also gets, I mean, it gets a bad rap for, you know, obviously, you know, some justified, some not, but, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of wrestlers have made some bad decisions. And, you know, so that's not necessarily to blame uh, the company like WWE oh, no. or anything, but no, not at all. I think it's, uh, you know, I can see where they're coming from. And li like I said, it's not a title that I asked for, but I mean, you know, it's okay if people want to consider me a hero. Sure, hashtag hero mode. That's all I keep hearing. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I shouted you. You know, a tweet. As I know, probably millions of people did. You know, you know, com commending you. I mean, it. I mean, you, you literally saved somebody's life, and and in this case, it happened. It also happened to be your mother, which is you know, I know. I'm sure I'm speak for all four of us. Was just like an an incredible feat, and yeah. and you you are a legitimate hero. And I your mean, mom yeah. is an incredibly brave woman. I don't know many people who would be able to keep their cool like that in a situation. Oh my God, she is. Cr it's she's amazing. so crazy. She's tough. Like you know, I pulled her out, and she, she was, raised this guy. Of course, she's got to be tough. <laughs> she oh. was worried about the photo albums. I mean, she wasn't even selling. <laughs> she wasn't even selling. I, I asked her. You know, when I got back, I don't know if it was before I left for Italy, because you know the Italy trip came at like the worst time. But right. it, it was a good show. But. Mm -hmm. I at least had a couple of days where uh, to digest it and all that, but um, you know, it was just I, I just could, you know I asked her I'm like you know what was going through your mind as this guy was doing all this because you know I told you I reflected on like that was what upset me the most is her being barricaded and listening to this dude talk to smack to her, and uh, you know I she, she don't even really sell it I mean she says she's freaked out but she doesn't really show it I mean she's a tough woman she raised me by herself and that's why mm -hmm. I'm saying like. There was no way I was gonna let her die. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, she's the one who will always be there for me. She's, you know, my mom raised me to, to be the man I am today. So, you know, I commend her yeah. for whatever actions sure. I did. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, let's not forget the unsung hero, the neighbor that called me, Francis. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, yeah. Thank God, she, you know, she didn't just blow it off. I mean, she told me something was going Thankfully down. Thankfully, she had your number. Yeah, yeah. Thank God she had my number. Thank God I wasn't out of town already at that right. point. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. a lot of things. Yeah, because like it was like a couple of days before you went to Italy. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So that would have been the worst. I mean, right. For sure. So since then, have you gotten um, any calls from like the WWE or TNA or anyone? Well, I. I immediately got, you know, the next day was crazy. Like yeah. you said, the tweets were, I mean, literally it was, uh, it was nice, but it was also stressful just mm -hmm. because like my, like I, you want to deal with your mom, but <laughs> you're getting all these calls and stuff. Well, yeah. when I yeah. called you, you were like, I've been on the phone all day long. <laughs> and oh, <laughs> yeah. It was like between my iPad and my phone, it was just constant, whether it was Facebook or Twitter or whatever, or, you know, it's just constant going, going off, which is, it was nice, but it was just so overwhelming too at the same time. But, um, you know, I kind of knew once Good Morning America called, I'm like, I got to do this. You know yeah. what I mean? You just, you, you're not going to say no to that. And now I've had, like, Katie Couric calling me, and mm -hmm. awesome. which is kind of cool. But um, And we're on the same level as that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, you guys got a big audience. Christian Couric. Yeah. <laughs> Christian Couric, yeah. I'm, I'll take her name, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, we, we, I know we, we got to get ready to start uh, wrapping things up, but um, I know as soon as we, you know, got this uh, scheduled, the first, like, shout, the first, you know, like, request was Josh saying, I want to be put in the master lock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, would that be cool? <laughs> 
I, do you really want that? I mean, have you thought this through? I, I mean, I, it's vicious. I, I know, but I was clanging and banging at 6 a.m. this morning. He signed a waiver. It's a story to tell. You're the one who sent that tweet. I saw that. He talked about work. What, what, what did he say? What you tweet? I was like, I was like 6 a.m. clanging and banging. Master Chris Masters ain't gonna get this master lock on me or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, what is this? You're about? like, who am I booked against? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I didn't know about guy. this one. Uh, uh, yeah, sure, we can do it if you're if you're gonna be so insistent and you're gonna twist my arm. <laughs> well, well, you're gonna, you're gonna head over. Normally, it's kind of like an area where people will dance or, yeah. or pose. But I, we it's have our best executive set. producer. I'm just gonna get there. Pat, just yeah, executive right producer now. Phil is is gonna switch your mic, Chris. Um, Josh, I think you might be micless, which might be good, so the fans don't hear the screams yeah, as much. Yeah, don't want to hear the screams. <laughs> hear the, the three of us, Corey, uh, Corey's fearing for his life right now. No, this is exciting. Oh, you, you're guys. enjoying it. You oh. gotta take care of him when he's. <laughs> Yeah, you, you gotta you gotta mend the wounds after I'll, Corey. I'll, I'll take care of that. Okay. Testing. Can you guys hear me? Uh, we, can, we can hear. Can you're I, loud. You're loud. Well, we can hear you loud and clear. All right. Yeah. So how's that? Good. That, so, all right. So <laughs> so so break down what you're going to like how you're. Well, I'm see what he's working with right now. Sure, you know, he's sure. got some trapezes here. That's not bad. <laughs> He's got a little bit of deltoids. You right, know, right. I can tell he works out a little bit, actually. The high, you know, I've got to tell you, you got to wear tighter shirts, I'm man. so excited for this. He usually does. wear tighter does. shirts to help does. you out. All right, but this is how it works. So, I mean, it's you guys know how basic, basic it is. Sure. But the key element here is the grip. You don't grip like this. You grip like this. <laughs> right. And you can see real What's that? He's already in pain. Make sure you're, you're doing it like that. Oh, yeah, I got it like this. He knows how to do he his move. He knows so how to do his move. So now is the point where you would try to get out. So, I mean, you can go ahead and make a little attempt here if you want. You know what I mean? I'm going to hook up. Come on, try. You have to, you have to kick his... <laughs> Have you ever lashed Chris Congeniality? Bobby Lashley, you're not. Bobby He's Lashley, you are not. His chair is in a Bobby Lashley. All right, all right. And one more try. One more try. Oh, he got it! He got it! He broke it! <laughs> History of pro wrestling just uh, occurred here. Yeah. Josh hey. Padgett broke the master lock. I gotta say, I just did the job on that one. It's his show. <laughs> it's his show. He was working out at 6 a.m. in the morning. He Come was, on. He was clanging and banging. Yeah. It, 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 was, it, was, it was devastating. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> exhilarating at the same wink, time. Wink, wink. Wink, <laughs> wink, right? <laughs> He put, little, little Chris food. Masters just put Josh Padgett over, ladies and gentlemen. He did it. He did it. He did it. Now I put everybody over. You do. My yeah. career's over. Oh, God. No, don't you say that. Your, your career, if anything, is skyrocketing more and more now, and you know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, um, thank you. He just well, took it out of Showtime. He's going. He's, he's third, his third run is starting right now. <laughs> well, From this moment. Yeah. Well, uh, Chris, you got anything you know to um, you know anything that that you want to plug? Just Obviously, fun. you want to plug your Twitter and everything like that, yeah, so the fans can follow you. Twitter at Chris Masters 310. Uh, bookings Masterpiece 83 at Gmail dot com. And uh, what are you trying to do? I oh, thought he was going to get you in the shot. I thought he was going to try to master lock me. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, that's not happening. But that's not after happening. the show. You know, I'll do the job for you, but, you know, you're not going to put it on me. Don't worry. People ask me that all the time. Like, I'll put master locks on people, not women, but uh, yeah. preferably, you know, like kids. They yeah, like yeah. the picture and whatever. But, like, whenever they ask me to put it on me, I'm like, eh. I think I've done it one time in my whole life where yeah. I was like, I let a fan do it, maybe. <laughs> I was just like, I don't like this. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just you can reach me there, and, uh, you know, I don't know. We'll see. See what the future holds, you know. Uh, well, yeah, we will see. For um, you know, we got to wrap it up. Music's playing, uh, Corey. If you want to plug your Twitter real quick, uh, K O R I O U S. Corey, um, you don't have a mic, but go ahead. Showtime, Josh, <laughs> boys and girls. Showtime, Josh on Twitter, yo. Uh, <laughs> my gosh. Uh, you can tweet me at Catherine Kelly, and and you can follow me at C Rosie V O C. One more time, special thanks, Chris Masters. Thank you Thank so you. much. We're Thanks checking for this out. Me. Guys, please share this video and iTunes with everything and tune in to other Afterbus shows. We will see you next time. From sure. Bing.com, executive producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Afterbuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the Afterbuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Bye. Bye. See you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.